The Gospel reading this morning is from John 9. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me until it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then he went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes. Then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, but he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they again said to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened, and he said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son? who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner, One thing I do know, though, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. 
Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do not see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. For the word of God in Scripture. For the word of God among us. For the word of God within us. Thanks, thanks be, be to, to God. God. It has been a week when we've not wanted to believe what we're seeing. And yet, the explosive images of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine are devastatingly clear. Putin is laser focused on the expansion of his power, no matter the cost or the collateral damage. In Putin's autocratic vision, people are expendable. Certainly the Ukrainians, but also his own military personnel, and even Russian civilians protesting on the streets, being arrested and removed immediately. In Russia, you are not allowed to see things differently than Putin, not without severe consequences anyway. Putin says that this invasion is about protecting a threat against Russian life from Ukraine, but no such threat exists as President Zelensky has reiterated. These leaders are painting two very different pictures of reality, aren't they? And while the democracies of the world can see through the thin veil of Putin's lies, they are still powerful enough to have all of us on edge as we watch this invasion unfold. Putin's vision is impaired by his insatiable hunger, it seems, for power and control which is exercised by flexing fear in the faces of all who stand in his way. He has been doing this for a long time. We should not be surprised by what we are seeing, even as it is still shocking. And because up until this point, few have been willing to stand up and obstruct his vision, he feels that whatever he sets his sights on, he can have unchecked power emboldens greed, doesn't it? From the loss of human life to the destruction of democracy to the demolition of cities and communities, the cost of this insatiable power is immense and it's really immeasurable. You can count bodies, and you can walk through the rubble of buildings that have fallen, but you cannot quantify the trauma that an entire country is experiencing and the generational trauma that these types of wars create and pass down. The editor of Baptist News Global, Mark Wingfield, was on a Zoom call Thursday with European Baptist Federation leaders hearing a first-hand report from a Baptist Ukrainian leader. And this Baptist leader in Ukraine said that he was feeling that day like he had been absorbed by a black hole, his soul being destroyed completely, feeling helpless, everything they've been living for seemingly almost about to be destroyed in an instant. 
He said that Ukraine is surrounded by the Russian army. Shooting is happening everywhere that he can hear, and some of the bombing has already hit near Baptist churches and organizations. In Odessa, a bomb exploded about 100 meters from a Baptist-run orphanage that's home to 60 children. After an hour of this conversation, the Ukrainian pastor was asked by the other European Baptist leaders to summarize his thoughts, and he replied, please keep praying and keep believing that God will be glorified, that God's love would prevail. As Ukrainians, we would want to say we would win, but our hope must be that God will be glorified. God's love will prevail. Mark Wingfield reflected back to his readership. Do you see the difference between the Ukrainian pastor's worldview and Putin's worldview? One wants to glorify himself, the other wants to glorify God. In the Hebrew prophets, we read, choose this day whom you will serve. We cannot serve two masters. So of course, in all times, at all places, we must ask ourselves who we would serve. And the answer to that question must always affect our politics, our purchases, our positions, and yes, even our posts on social media. And we, of course, as Christians, are called not to serve any political leader, but to serve the God who came as a human person, humble in spirit, compassionate in heart, who cared more about healing and love than heeding any certain law or staking a claim on any land. But you know, we all are human too. And we cannot point the finger at political leaders without realizing that the hubris that limits their vision and leads them to war to get what they want is the same hubris that leads us to our own kind of spiritual and social blindness. Pride is pride, and it always leads to a fall. Maybe not of a nation of people, but certainly of the notion that all people are beloved. We let that truth fall time and time again, and for what? Often for the sake of preserving ourselves, preserving our way of life, protecting our way of thinking, promoting our way of believing or being, But pride obstructs compassion and empathy, growth and learning. When we are so sure that we are right in how we see the world, we lose our capacity to right the wrongs that we have yet to see that are all around us. None of us is seeing the full picture of our lives or our world right now. We cannot, we all have limited vision And I wonder that if we would accept this, rather than deny it, we might just be a more peace-filled planet. Our text today speaks of this limited vision in terms of blindness, but I prefer to speak of this reality in terms of sight and insight, or the lack thereof. For as we see in the text, physical sight is one healing, but spiritual insight is the other. The former is immediate and considered miraculous. The latter is gradual and is considered questionable at best, heretical at worst, by the authorities at least. However, God sees both as beautiful, I think, Before we dive into the text fully, just a word about the physical ability to see and what is sometimes called a disability of blindness. In biblical times, blindness was considered bad. There was not 
a consideration that though one might not have the ability to physically see, that probably also meant that they had deeper abilities in other senses, like a sharper and more nuanced sense of hearing or more sensitive touch. Even more, as the disciples' question reveals, blindness or any kind of illness or disability or perceived difference or weakness, those things were understood to be connected to sin. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? This was the theological worldview back in biblical days, but if we're honest with ourselves, we have remnants of this theology within us today. How many of us, when our lives seem to be falling apart or full of bad luck, have found ourselves wondering, what did I do to deserve this? I've been nothing but faithful and good. I, I've tried my best to do everything right. Or maybe the opposite. Maybe our inner dialogue is, serves me right. This must be what I get for doing X, Y, or Z a few years ago. Karma is a you know what. Now even if we're joking when we say such comments or when we think them to ourselves, there is a kernel of truth in the humor that reveals that many of us still try to equate our behavior or our strength of faith to our health or our circumstances. We will most likely never be able to answer most of the whys of our life, why things happen. But our worth has nothing to do with those whys. Our worth is not an answer to any question of what we have done or haven't done, what we believe or do not believe, why this happened or didn't happen. Our worth in God's eyes is bestowed on us at our birth. We are worthy of love and wholeness no matter what we do or don't do. Yes, sometimes our consequences have actions. Yes, sometimes tragic things happen to us. Yes, sometimes we can't even parse out which is which. But at all times, we are worthy of God's love and we are held equally and fully in the gaze of God's love. But we get this bad theology about sin and circumstance, in part because of how we have read scripture through the years and how interpretations have been passed down to us. There are all kinds of interpretive issues which I can't get into today, but we face them all the time. I mean, just looking at the context of then and now, that's one big interpretive issue. But the translation of verse three that we read today from the New Revised Standard Version is one of the most poorly translated verses in all of scripture. Why? Because it reads, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. So that God's works might be revealed in him. As if God needed to show off how awesome God was, so God made one man blind so that one day he could be healed as an example of God's awesomeness. But nowhere in the Greek are the words, he was born blind so that. Those words are added. If you read the Greek in the original text as Joanne Brandt translates, it says, neither did this one nor his parents sin, period. But in order that the works of God might be manifest to you, it is necessary for us to work the works of the one who has sent me. That's what the Greek says. Neither the man nor his parents sinned, period, end of sentence. Unlike autocratic leaders, God does not need humans to be expendable means to prove God's power. And after Jesus debunks this sin correlation, he begins a new sentence altogether, a new thought, in order that the works of God might be revealed. We must work the works of the one who sent me. 
In other words, sin isn't the issue. It never is with Jesus. The issue is whether or not our actions are making manifest the works of God in the world. And this is why John doesn't actually call the miracle in his gospel miracles, right? He calls them signs because they always point to something beyond Jesus himself. They reveal something about God that we're supposed to learn through the person of Jesus. The sign, you see, is not just about what we see happening in front of us, it's about Jesus pointing us to something we have yet to see, but need to learn about ourselves and the world. What matters is for God's works to be made real in the world. We are the ones who make real those works. And to make them real, we have to see them. Not just with our sight, but with new insight that God is giving us every day through Christ. Now here's the Cliff Notes version of this text. I don't know if they still have cliff notes, but back in my day in high school and college, that's what we did before we had Google and Wikipedia. If we didn't read our assignment, we looked at the cliff notes version. This is it. The man who was blind from birth enters the story without physical vision and honestly with limited spiritual vision, but by the end he can see clearly both spiritually and physically. The authorities, or the teachers of the law, the most overtly religious people in the text, they enter the story being able to see physically and thinking that they're able to see spiritually, but by the end of the story, they are revealed as being spiritually blind. They are without the insight that would give them true sight. And while the 41 verses of this passage provide many preaching directions, I can only pick one for today, and this is it. Vision is a continuum. And how we see either progresses or regresses, depending on our willingness to have our vision refracted. None of us are 100% spiritually blind, nor do any of us have 20-20 spiritual vision. Rather, like the eye doctor asking us to focus on the itty-bitty letters at the bottom of the screen, flipping lenses in front of us saying, is one better or two, two or three, three or four? We must always ask ourselves and allow others to ask us how our vision might be refracted to more clearly see the world as Jesus invites us to see it. And here's a fair warning. The more we clearly see the world as Jesus sees it, the fuzzier and cloudier our previous ways of seeing can seem. In other words, it's gonna get blurrier before it gets better. So let's take a look, because throughout this story, the man who was born blind has a spiritual progression. His insight gradually deepens and develops. As he's explaining what happened to him to his neighbors, at first he just says, the man called Jesus. Put mud on my eyes, sent me to the pool to wash, and I got my sight. Later, the Pharisees are questioning him, and he calls the man, Jesus now, a prophet, another layer of meaning. Then the Pharisees question him a second time, and he says at that point that Jesus is from God, a third layer of meaning. And finally, when he speaks to Jesus at the end of the passage, he asks him with a spirit of curiosity and not certainty, who is the Son of Man? Tell me. I want to know so I can believe in him. And he listens. Side note, it's not all about seeing. Hearing matters too. He listens to what Jesus says about it being the person who's standing right in front of him. And at that moment, the man says, I believe and he worships Jesus. Physical sight might be immediate, but usually spiritual insight is gradual. Of course, the contrast is given with the Pharisees, the religious authorities, because they believe they already have full spiritual sight. They follow the law, they see the world in one way, they feel like they already have the sight they need to determine how God works in the world, to discern or judge who is from God and who is not. 
Their vision is impaired by their pride and their locked in way of believing. They have no room for revelation, no willingness to let their vision be refracted by reality. And the clearer the evidence of the healing becomes, the more the Pharisees bear down and say, well, Jesus has to be a sinner because he broke the Sabbath. They, they literally cannot discern that God has any action in anyone who would break the Sabbath, right? Who would break such a law. So they miss the action of God that's right before their eyes. These religious officials are confronted with a miracle but because it was at odds with their belief, rather than question their belief or their way of thinking about the world around them, they just attempt to disprove the miracle, to not see what they were actually seeing. How often do we do this too? I wonder if maybe the problem is not that Jesus doesn't always agree with our worldview, but that our worldview might be too small to accommodate or to house what Jesus is doing in the world. Because Jesus keeps pushing his critics, those who are most sure of their spiritual sight, to see that the problem maybe is not that he's the lawbreaker, but that their worldview does not allow for the glory of God to break in through their lives in new and unpredictable and miraculous ways. This text was really timely for me this week because I had my annual eye doctor appointment on Friday. And it got me thinking. You know, when it comes to our physical sight, we have no problem going to the eye doctor the minute that a cataract is obstructing our view or the change in the contour of our lens is making our vision fuzzy. We want to be able to see clearly, so we wear glasses or contacts. We have LASIK surgery or cataract surgery. We want to get our physical sight fixed. In fact, for those of us who were born able to physically see, it's quite a scary and uncertain thing to begin to realize that we might be losing our vision. We wonder how we'll navigate the world around us, and so we do anything to correct that vision as quickly as possible. Our vision is too essential to just let it fade without trying to fix it. And yet, when it comes to our spiritual sight, we are A-OK -okay with having blurry, fuzzy, or even obstructed vision. We'd rather walk around in the world maybe not looking at the truth head on, because if we did, that means we'd have to change something about our lives, the way we spend our money, what we believe, how we vote. So we might just intentionally allow our spiritual sight to be blurred or just tell ourselves that what we're seeing is the full truth when the reality is we know our peripheral vision is blocked or we know there is something we're not seeing. For some reason, we like to assume that our spiritual vision or our moral vision is 2020, that whatever we've been taught is the only lens we need. We're far less open to corrective lenses when it comes to our religious, spiritual, political, moral vision, aren't we? We don't like to be corrected by others. We don't like to admit we may need a refraction. But isn't that kind of absurd? Of course we're not born with perfect spiritual vision or focused moral understanding or clear political beliefs. We have to continually refract our vision and allow ourselves to realize that the field of vision, of what we need to be focusing on, might even be vaster than we ever realized. There's no shame in saying, oh, I never saw something that way before. How you're looking at it, yeah, that, that's changing how I look at it now too. Isn't this what it means to follow Jesus? To allow Jesus to be the refracting lens that's refining our focus, giving us clarity, expanding our field of vision and our ability to see nuance and perspective. And that means, to keep the metaphor going, that perhaps we need to be optometrists and ophthalmologists for one another. 
helping each other correct our vision or see something differently, and even seeking out others and saying, will you look at this with me? Is one better or two? <laughs> two or three? Today, friends, may we be humbly reminded that the more we think we know, the more likely we are to be blind or short-sighted to what we do not know. Will we allow Jesus to serve us both the sight that we need to heal the hurting, but also the insight we need to change how we see the hurting world around us and even ourselves? As we're seeing in the case of Putin's invasion of Ukraine, it is often easier to see something clearly when it's at a distance from us. We can so easily point fingers and say, how can this be? How can they be doing that? But so many things in our own country's politics and belief systems and the way we function and we're taught, so many things have become like cataracts clouding our vision, haven't they? It's happened gradually, but it prevents us from having the clarity we need to stop or to speak up against the powers that put profits and pride over people. And history has sadly taught us that good people can follow fallible leaders until they fall, not even realizing they're on a path that's leading to their own destruction until it's too late. So may we, as followers of Christ, actively seek to have our vision refracted. May we realize that not a single one of us sees the whole picture. We need each other to refine and focus and fine tune. Jesus invites us to see the world with the gaze of God. And to do so, we must allow our sight to be corrected and to realize that that kind of correction is not shameful or sinful, it's what it means to grow in the image and likeness of God. Vision is a continuum. Sight is shaped in relationship. Insight is gained in community. So you know how the beloved Christmas carol asks, do you see what I see? The answer is probably not, which is why we need each other. Amen.